next on the Broadway show, Picture Perfect. I'm catching up with Nathan Lane to talk about the new play, Pictures from Home. Plus, Rachel Brosnahan and Oscar Isaac are on the show to talk about their new off-Broadway play. In a whole new world, you'll meet Broadway's newest Princess Jasmine. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. So glad you're with us for this latest edition of The Broadway Show. It's going to be a good one. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Picture this. It's Pictures from Home, starring Nathan Lane, Danny Burstein, and Zoe Wanamaker. It's a play that's all about bringing photographs to life. I caught up with Nathan Lane at the Roseville Cocktail Room at the Civilian. This is your 25th Broadway show, right? Mm, yes, okay. I, yes, that's what they tell me. <laughs> that's what they tell you. That's what how, my, how, my, my keepers tell me, yes. <laughs> how are you feeling? I mean, that, that old, pandemic, no. Terribly old. No, I like, listen, I talk about age all the time because I'm, yeah. I, once I hit 50, I thought, I gotta keep that conversation going. Age is an interesting thing to talk about these days. And I sure. know that's what you're talking about every night right now. But it really is something that we're looking at a little differently these days, don't you think? I think we are aging differently. Well, there are there are people who don't want to age. Sure. So there are no people to play el the elderly anymore. <laughs> you know, it's always the you know sixty is the new whatever the new forty or <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it no, is anymore. People are there's so many things to help keep you young or right. or either cosmetically or 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 health wise mentally you mentally so that people uh, yeah are living much longer now and so it's different than say for example the characters in this play it's sure. taking place in the early 80s so it, people in their 70s then it was it's a little different and you are talking about age and you are talking about life and you're talking about what's important you know when i read it i just thought I just was incredibly moved by it, and uh, and it's also because it's about parents and and death. <laughs> it's funny. There's a great deal of humor as well. And I, I think getting to know people too that you know you, you think you know all through your life. You think you know your parents. You think you know your your family, mm. and then you you learn about them in a new way. And I wonder if the audience feels that way too, or now they have new questions about their own parents or their own mortality. It is a play that makes people want to talk or they want to call their parents right. ch check in with them I mean it's something we all have to go through with seeing our parents age seeing ourselves age you know the play is has, has these very universal themes it's very relatable only murders in the building I have to bring that up because sure. it was certainly nice to see you pop up it just looked like it was fun to do yeah well, sure. I, I won an Emmy, so <laughs> what could be bad about that? It's never bad. But I know you don't do things for that. I know you do things for because they interest you. I've I only hope a... to win an Emmy, that's all. <laughs> you know, I've known Marty and Steve for a long time and, and so I, I when they said that we want you to that they want you to play this part, I said, mm -hmm. Great and and, uh, and I thought it was just gonna be comedy. You know, I won for for doing drama in a comedy. I know. This very special episode they did which was the silent episode mm -hmm. and I, because I have a I have a deaf son and all of our scenes were I was doing American sign language right. it was much m more challenging and 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 it was very not what I expected which was all which is always great what's next for you what's next is I have this movie called Bo is Afraid starring Joaquin Phoenix it's an epic tale of guilt and a <laughs> A man's odyssey to get home to see his mother. Oh, wow. Yes, I've been referring to it as the Jewish everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> it's a three hour art house film mm -hmm. that, uh, <laughs> that I think will, people will love it or hate it. Want to see more of my interview? Head over to Broadway.com for an extended cut. Get ready to be a part of it. New York, New York heads to Broadway this spring. Set in 1946, World War II is over, New York City is rebuilding, and dreams are big. It's inspired by the 1977 film by Martin Scorsese with the iconic music of Candor and Ebb and new lyrics from Lin-Manuel Miranda. We caught up with the stars. I think we, we suggest the movie quite a lot, but philosophically they're doing something different and to me, it feels exactly like what the city is. You're getting yourself into New York City. That's what you're gonna experience. You're gonna experience all that New York City has to offer. You're going to fall in love. You're going to get your heart broken. You're gonna step in a puddle. You're gonna step in dog doo-doo. 
Um, and you're going to be reminded of why you love the city and, and what makes it so special because there's no place like it on earth. And I, I know we all say that, but it's true. You can you can be whoever you want here. You can become who you're supposed to become here. I'm a puddle. I'm a just, I'm an absolute, <laughs> I'll cry now. Um, no, I mean, to see this man that I have so much respect for, John Kander, going, I have an idea. Getting up and sprinting to the piano and then playing the most beautiful lick you've ever heard in your life. I just weep all the time. I just am, I'm crying. Lynn and I had written a song together which seemed to me ideal uh, to open as the, as the opening music of the show. And I asked him if he, if he felt okay about our using it. And he, and he never got a faster yes in his life. We all come here to New York to sort of become who we are or who we want to be, and it's hard. But at the same time, I think success as a New Yorker is when you walk into your bodega and you go there so much that they already know your order the moment you walk in and you create community and you create found families uh, and you find a way to to survive in it. And, and I, I think the show embraces all of that. Um, I don't think it sugarcoats New York. I think it just tries to get as much of New York on stage as possible. Before they hit it big, both Rachel Brosnahan and Oscar Isaac got their starts on the New York stage. Now they've teamed up for a rare piece of theater history. Paul's here with the story. That's right, Tamsin. After the incredible success of A Raisin in the Sun, Lorraine Hansberry premiered The Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window on Broadway briefly before her death. We're here at BAM on opening night of this exciting new revival. Oscar, I'm so glad you are back on stage. You know, I, I always think of you as a theater person, no matter what you do. You can be, you can be in Star Wars, Saving mm -hmm. the Galaxy, but to me, you're still a, a theater guy. Is that yeah. how you think of yourself? Yeah, I mean, that's how I, that's where I first started, you know, yeah. I'm a creature of the stage and uh, it, it always, I always feel the pull to come back and particularly when there's something really exciting or different or new, uh, a new challenge to, to undertake. And this is definitely that. <sighs> certainly is, yeah. <laughs> this is a, sort of a, an epic mm. Lorraine Hansberry play that no one, I don't want to say no one's seen it, but I feel like, you, you know, based on percentages, it's basically a, no one's seen it. Yeah, it's a big kind of a mess of a play, a beautiful yeah. mess of a play. You know, it, it was, there was so much. She was, towards the end of her life, she, she knew that she had a little bit of time left and she was so young and had so much left to say. And I feel you can feel some of that energy with the play. And, and in a way, it's a bit of an unfinished piece because she never really got to hone it in and edit it. But I think that's also part of the beauty of, of it. I think you can't help but feel, feel a bit of that tragedy that, that she, you could, clearly she had so much to say and so much more she, was, she wanted to say. When you heard this was happening, yeah. what about this made you want to say yes? Well, we did a couple readings of this over the course of a few years, and I had read the play for the first time, and it was gorgeous, but hearing it out loud was really spectacular. I couldn't believe how modern it felt, how it felt like Lorraine was seeing into the future back in the 60s, and we did another reading in 2021, and Oscar and Annie asked me to do the play, and I was so excited to be able to say yes. So you've been dreaming about Sidney Brewstein. I've been dreaming about <laughs> Sydney for, for years now. <laughs> and you play Iris, yeah. uh, his wife. What sort of clicked with her for you and about their relationship? What, 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 what do you find interesting about the dynamic? I love their relationship. It feels messy and imperfect, and they're, we're catching them both in a moment of transition. The play sort of follows these two people and a lot of others, but two people who have stopped believing in each other's abilities to achieve their dreams, and that's kind of heartbreaking and difficult. But they love each other so deeply and so it's been really exciting to find the fight for their marriage. And you play Sydney back in Greenwich Village. I'm a big fan of Inside Lewin Davis, mm. so I love that you're back in Greenwich Village at that right. time. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice yeah. little tip of the hat to that. Yeah. But yeah, it's really Bohemia, right? That, that's where yeah. she wanted to sort of set it, so all those social and political and Yeah, the upheaval and also there was a 
huge moment of transition. Um, you know, the civil rights movement was about to break open, the psychedelic movement was about to happen, Dylan was about to plug in and go electric. So this was the end of an era, it was like the, the transition, like the, the reptile with the mammalian jaw, you know, it was like coming out <laughs> of the, something, something was growing, something was happening. And so, and she was writing about what she knew, that's where she was living, she was writing about her friends, people, similarly to what's happening now, you know, people that are burnt out as well, politically with all the upheaval, not really knowing what to do. There is a, a big push to withdraw and just focus on the self. And this is kind of a call to continue to feel, to continue to put yourself out there, to continue to engage uh, however one can. As a real theater fan, this has always been this fascinating play. Whenever I read about Lorraine Hansberry, I was just like, okay, I've seen Raisin in the Sun regularly, and then nobody does this play. I have to say I'm really shocked that even being a theater enthusiast, a theater practitioner, yeah. a theater whatever, that you know this play. Because I've come across a lot of people who don't know this play. And so that seemed like a, you know, that seemed like a worthwhile mission. Then they're shocked that it's not right. about a black family. or right. And there's one character. Who right? passes for white, yeah. Right. It says so much about her, Lorraine Hansberry, yeah. and about her career and maybe what people thought was a very specific career. Actually, this woman was interested in a lot more than that, right? People, what people don't understand is that this milieu that she's writing about was her milieu in the West Village. She lived this life. She knew these people. These are characters from her life and these are, her, these are also her. There's pieces of her in each character. Lorraine Hansberry wrote this play. What do you love about her and about her talents and about her story and about the story she wanted to tell? Because she was dying when she wrote this play, there's so much of her voice and her questions about the world around her and her philosophy about what it means to be a, a person moving through the world, a queer woman, a queer black woman, an artist that filters through all these different characters in, in different ways. I think the thing I love about her the most is that she believed deeply in people's ability to change. And that she was frustrated with her fellow artists and many of her fellow playwrights for giving over to what she felt like was despair about the world around them and making art that felt like it was purposeless in some way and, and just sort of giving into that idea rather than trying to move things and change things and infuse energy into the issues ahead of them. Emmy and Oscar winner Aaron Sorkin's got a new show on Broadway this spring. It's his adaptation of the classic Lerner and Lowe musical Camelot. We talked to the stars. My thesis was that there's an emotional, powerful version of this story uh, to be had without magic wands. Sorkin's decision to take the magic out of it, I think is so great because it forces us to say that this is real and that these are actually human beings trying to figure out a better system for the world. The idea that we can take a beloved piece of art, a work, a story, a legend, and recreate it to mean something to us as a modern day audience is really meaningful. Sans the Learner and Low Music, a lot is different and new. And it, uh, it's, it's more of a new piece than ever ever before. Things that you thought you knew for sure get questioned. The whole origin story of Arthur uh, and the sword gets uh, questioned in the show. Listen, if you're going to do a Camelot, uh, a King Arthur story with no magic, then I don't think he pulled the sword out of a stone. Still plenty more to talk about on this edition of the Broadway show. Coming up, Starlight, Star Bright. We're going to introduce you to the singing wait staff at Ellen's Stardust Diner. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. Hi, I'm Ashley Loren, and I play Satine in Moulin Rouge the Musical on Broadway, and you're watching The Broadway Show. Welcome back to The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get to it. Ellen Stardust Diner's a Broadway icon, and also home to the famous singing waitstaff. Let's send it out to Perry Sook. Thanks, Tamsin. For a performer, making it to Broadway is a dream come true. But for the waiters at Ellen Stardust Diner, it's a reality, literally. I'm about to head inside to meet one of the performing waiters here at Ellen Stardust Diner. On the outside, always looking good. Never be more than a bonus man. Tap, 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 and all the best. So I'm here with Mitch Gray at a 
packed lunch shift here at Ellen Stardust Diner. What is it like working here? It's super fun. I mean, it's a world known place, right? Yeah. So people are coming from all over the place and everyone that comes in is really excited to be here. So it's a lot of high energy, a lot of fun, and a lot of great people that I work with too. So. What are your uh, go-to songs so here at go-to, we can do stuff kind of all across the board, um, giving some musical theater, waving through a window. There you go. Um, give the people what they want, the classic, <laughs> you know, we'll do some Grease, throw in some Harry Styles for fun in there as well. Oh, nice. So that hits every time. Um, and I do a little country music too in there too. Awesome. So uh, for, you know, those of our viewers who have not seen it, you know, I've seen you guys on the banquette, uh, you know, leaning over the edge of the aisles. Tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day here, you know, and a shift in your songs and your performances. Yeah, so we're, I mean, spending the most of our shifts as servers, right? That's our primary job. So we're taking orders, we're running milkshakes, doing all of that. And then when it's our time to sing, our MC calls us up and we grab a mic, do the thing. Sometimes you're doing both at the same time. I'll run a milkshake <laughs> and sing some Harry Styles. So I'm assuming you're also a performer outside of Ellen. So yes. uh, you know what? What are the goals and aspirations there? I mean, I'd love to get on Broadway. We're on the street already, so you know, I'd love to move down to one of the theaters. But I also am looking to get more into TV film acting as well. I just wrapped up a production of Bad Out of Hell in Las Vegas on the strip there. Had a nice little six month run there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I'm just fresh back to the city and back to the diner. Obviously, you're performing every day right here on Broadway. What does that do to help you and keep your chops up, you know, going into those auditions for Bad Out of Hell, for anything moving forward? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're singing, we're doing an eight hour shift and we're singing at least once an hour. So it's a lot. And then talking over that um, with all of our customers that come in. So the vocal endurance, it's oh, helped yeah. me a ton in that. I get to practice audition songs. I'm like, oh, I got uh, this coming up. Let's <laughs> let's throw that in at work, test it on an audience before I go into a room. So it's, it's great for all those reasons. We are right here on Broadway. You are a performer with aspirations to be on Broadway. What does Broadway mean to you? Broadway to me is a lot about community, right? I mean, it's a, another thing like this diner is known worldwide. Everybody knows about Broadway, right? So it's one of those things that anybody from my small town in Wisconsin, people I met that were from London, you know, that come into the diner here, like everybody knows about Broadway and it's just such a great community feel and being able to be close to it and hopefully there someday soon um, would just be mean a lot to reach a wide audience of amazing people from all over the place. Thanks for staying with us for this latest edition of the Broadway show. Glad you're here. Disney's Aladdin has a brand new Princess Jasmine, and she's this week's fresh face. Hi, my name is Sonia Valsara, and I play Princess Jasmine in Disney's Aladdin on Broadway. I love the movie. I grew up watching the movie. Jasmine was like one of my favorite princesses as a kid. And I actually played Jasmine when I was like 11, 12 years old in Aladdin Junior in middle school. That may have been like one of my first lead opportunities as a kid. So <laughs> she's very near and dear to my heart. A big moment in my like artistic journey as a kid was I went to go see Oklahoma at a local high school. And I went home and rented the movie and then like paused and played the movie over and over and over again and wrote a script and then cast my friends at school and we'd have rehearsal at recess. And then I like put the show on in my living room. My dad was driving me to AP Bio at like 5.30 in the morning one day and in like classic brown dad fashion was like, you have to decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. Truly, I was like a sophomore in high school and was like, oh, if I had to make a decision right now and not have any regrets, it would be going into theater. Okay, I'm actually like kind of obsessed with gardening. The idea of growing something from the soil is like super nurturing and inviting to me. And I volunteer at like a lot of parks in New York City. Doing that kind of stuff just grounds me and makes me feel more connected to my true purpose. My favorite thing about New York is the people. Yeah, I just don't think there's a place that contains more authenticity, creativity, diversity, and honesty. People are just so honest in this city and I crave it. My first bow in Aladdin was so overwhelming and so beautiful. My whole family was in the audience and I felt so supported by the family I've created here. It totally took my breath away. It's such an honor and it's such a privilege to play Jasmine, to inspire young people 
who don't necessarily see themselves represented on stage. Jasmine really represents people who look at the world in a different way and are willing to fight for the vision of the world they want to see. I think that's really inspiring for little kids to see and to see someone who is on stage that looks like them and also has compassion and joy and expresses all of these different array of emotions on stage. I think that that is the greatest honor. I mean, it's everyone's like dream to be a princess on Broadway, like <laughs> everyone's dream. And so I am, um, I'm very grateful, very grateful to be here. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.